I definitely think that the two months in between this semester and the next semester are a good time to learn a musical instrument. Um, okay, so today uh, we're going to start chapter five, induction. But before I do that, I want to open this. Oh, first of all, um, I'm going to keep it real with you all. I did not finish grading your tests. Um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to finish that up this weekend. Um, you know, forgive me, please. Uh, so, but uh, you can still discuss the test with me. Like you, if you have questions about the problems, I'm happy to discuss those. Okay, that's that's part one. Um, part two is, if any of y'all have questions on functions, I know last time someone had some questions on functions, uh, and I'd be happy to answer those for like five minutes before I get into um, induction or any other questions. So, any questions? Anyone have any further? Uh, ah, okay. How to find the 2.5 homework problems. Okay, what's up? Oh, shoot. Right, 2.5 is in, in people's books. Okay, um, there is a PDF of the whole text that I got from one of you and that I need to chop up and so that I can post section 2.5 and the problems to it. Um, I said I was gonna do that like a week ago, but as you can probably guess, it's been a rough week. Um, yeah, so I will post those in the resources, I think. Uh, I'll do that today. Also, there are a bunch of people in class who have a PDF um, of the full text, but I still should be held responsible. Any further questions either on function composition or injectivity, surjectivity, stuff like that, or about all that wacky cardinality stuff that we were doing last time where we showed that the cardinality of the positive integers is the same as the cardinality of the rationals, but different from the cardinality of the reals and how we have these actual chains of uh, higher and higher cardinalities by taking power sets. Yeah, well, that's about how I feel too. Oh, can I do another example of cardinalities? Um, so I've already kind of done all of the low hanging fruit, so to speak for cardinalities. So the, the, the famous, the fa so I, I can actually, yeah. Um, there's a good example that I can do. Okay, so let's, let's talk about, yeah. Let's first discuss what we covered last time. So something is, so uh, a set is countable if what? If it is either finite or what's the other way that you can be countable? In bijection, with the positive integers. Now, if it's in bijection with the integers, then it's also in bijection with the positive integers because we know that there's a bijection between the positive integers and the integers. So saying bijection to the integers isn't wrong, it's just not our definition, right? But if you're, if you're in bijection with the positive integers, you can also produce a bijection with the integers. Okay, so, I'm going to do a little circle here. And these are going to be things that are countable and that we've shown to be countable. So z greater than 0 is countable by definition. 
Z greater than zero is our measuring stick, so to speak. Z is countable. We I produced a bijection that was like flipping back and forth, right? Um, Q greater than zero is countable. That was the, the kind of grid argument where I was going by diagonals. And by a similar example, Q is countable. Um, yes, that's essentially correct. Although we haven't proven that it's the smallest infinity. Uh, that's true, but we haven't proven it. And then there will be many other sets that are infinite that are not countable. Um, it turns out that a, a countable union of countable sets is countable. So countable union of countable sets is countable. Uh, so maybe this is one that I can prove for you. And the proof will be uh, very similar to one that you've already seen. So let's assume, oh, and, and now I should make a different, different categories. R is uncountable. R, well, the interval from zero to one was our first uncountable set. And that's gonna have the same cardinality as R. So these two are uncountable. I can't necessarily say that these are the first next up, but I just know that these are uncountable sets. And then I also know that the power set of the reals is of a greater cardinality. And then once again, the power set of the power set of the reals is of a greater cardinality. So these are the kind of going up. Yeah, the in this case, Countable is truly the smallest infinity. It turns out that there are very deep questions about asking whether or not there's anything in between here. Um, great. Uh, P of R, I believe, would be LF2. Yes, I believe that's the case. OK, so let's, let's prove that a countable union of countable sets is countable. So let's assume that we have sets A sub I, um, where I is in the positive integers, and each set A sub I is countable. OK? By the way, is the writing clear? Uh, is, are things blurry today, or is this OK? That's good. OK. So I want to prove, prove that the union over all i in z greater than 0 of the ai is countable. What I'm going to assume is that all of these sets are disjoint. So AI intersect AJ is equal to the empty set. This isn't necessary, but it just will make my proof much, uh, much easier. OK? So I'm taking a countable union of countable sets. And what I'm essentially going to do is I'm going to list them. I'm going to say I'm going to list A1 as a set. And I'm going to say A1 consists of elements uh, a1, A2, A3, A4, and so on down to infinity. Listing something like this, if I can do a first element and then a second element and then a third element, and then I can list them off in a kind of one directional list, this is equivalent to saying that the set is countable because I'm making a bijection between the elements of this set and the positive integers, right? Now I'm going to list off in a certain way, the elements of A2, and I'm going to call them B1, B2, B3, B4, and so on. Now I'm going to list the elements of A3 and call them C1, C2, C3, C4, and so on. Maybe I'll do some more. A5, A6, B5, B6, C5, C6. 
Uh, A4, I'm going to call its elements D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6. OK, so now you agree that what I'm doing is I'm setting up every element in this infinite union on a grid in this fashion. And does anyone have a guess for what I'm going to do now? To make a bijection between this set and the positive integers. Is it going to be the diagonal thing that we did with the rationals? Yep, I'm going to do diagonals again. I'm going to say 1 goes to a1. 2 goes to a2, 3 goes to b1, 4 goes to c1, 5 goes to b2, 6 goes to a3, 7 goes to a4, uh, yep, a4, 8 goes to, so I'm just going to snake through via diagonals again. And notice that my assumption that all of the intersections are disjoint means that I'm not going to skip any elements this time. When I was doing this for the rationals or the positive rationals, I had to skip an element if I had already counted it. But this nice assumption just means, oh, I'm just going to take every diagonal like this. And thus, this will set up a bijection between the positive integers and every element of this countable union of countable sets. Any questions here? So what this means, for instance, does this work in 3D? Uh, yeah, this works in 3D. But the point is, we actually don't need to care about 3D because I could have just arranged that in a two-dimensional way, right? Like this, this argument already shows in a two-dimensional array that z cubed is countable. Or even q to the n is countable. Because all of these can be thought of as finite unions of countable sets. And here I actually prove something stronger. This is a countable union of countable sets. So I don't even need to think about 3D although I could work in 3D, but that wouldn't actually, that would make the proof more complicated and it wouldn't give me a stronger result than I'm proving just with this technique. Any more questions on this? Isn't this stuff cool? Okay, no response. No one thinks Cantor's cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it is indeed crazy, I agree. This actually was like a really controversial like collection of results. So Cantor was actually refused positions at famous universities in Germany and it made him suffer some like mental health issues because people like, couldn't handle the truth. Um, if we were to prove this on a test or homework, is the picture enough? Yeah, this picture is sufficient as long as you make the appropriate corrections, right? Like if you're doing it with the rationals, you have to write out how you're avoiding the non-reduced rationals. Here, if you're snaking through everything, you have to make the additional assumption that their intersections are trivial. If their intersections were non-trivial, you'd have to add a little thing saying, if one of these terms is the same as a term that's been previously counted, then we can skip it, right? I have a question. Yeah, sure. So when we're proving like whether a, um, a set is countable or not, is like this diagonal snake approach pretty typical of what we'll do? Um, yes, in the sense that this is one of the most basic tools that can appear. If you have some collection of sets which are countable, or if you can somehow parametrize the set you're interested in, in terms of countable sets in a grid-like fashion, then you can do this diagonal argument. So I would say it's pretty common. The, the additional tools to work with countability are kind of 
things that we haven't proven yet. So there's a famous um, theorem called Schroeder-Bernstein, which I probably can't really ask you about, um, but it's in the textbook. Uh, what I mean to say is there are more techniques, but we haven't really discussed them. So this is probably the things to keep in mind are this argument, uh, the argument for showing that Z is countable, and the argument for showing that the interval from zero to one is not countable. And maybe Gödel's proof that power sets have different cardinalities than, than the original sets. So the three proofs that I did last class are the three to keep in mind. I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> Any further questions? That's true, but I wish that we had like a classroom setting so that I could, you know, not talk for a little bit while y'all worked on something together or I don't know. Okay, so what's the vote? Do we move on to induction or are we good here? Well, those are the same. Do we want to do more here or should we move on to induction? Time to induct. All right, good move. Induction. This is our <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Lots of uses for the word induce. Um, let's uh, do the mathematical version. Um, mathematical induction. is a way to prove statements about, uh, so mathematical induction, a way to prove uh, statements like PN for all positive integers N. Um, so an example of such a statement and one that we'll actually prove is something like one plus all the way up to n is equal to uh, n times n plus one over two. So really what this statement is, is over here I've got a, so p of k is equal to the summation from one to k, or sorry, from i equals one all the way up to k of i. This is equal to k times k plus one over two. This is the statement uh, p of k. So it's asserting some equality on the left hand for a sum involving k, and on the right hand, a product involving the number k. And so what we want to show is that this relationship holds for all positive integers k. So this is, this is the type of statement that we would like to prove. And so there are two pieces to an inductive proof. Oh, by the way, this is the last proof technique that we'll learn in this class. Very exciting. So the technique is as follows. There are two pieces. The first is called the basis step. And essentially here, you're going to prove P of 1 or P of 2. Like your base case doesn't have to start at 1. It could be P of 0 or P of 5. We'll see a couple different examples. But you kind of want to prove the bottom rung of the ladder, so to speak. So I'll, I'll pretend like we're always starting at P of 1. Then the second step is the inductive case or inductive step. And what we show here, oh, the two, where's a two? I don't see it, I mean, there's a two here. P 
pieces. Oh, pieces. Yeah, pieces. The basis step and then the inductive step. And the in inductive step is we show, we show for arbitrary k that p of k implies p of k plus 1. So this is the metaphor that they give in the book, and it's a nice metaphor. Essentially, you imagine that you have a ladder. Maybe it's like a fire escape ladder, so it's a couple feet off the ground. Here's the fire escape ladder. And you want to get up to some arbitrary height on this ladder. So the basis step is like, can you jump onto the ladder? Can, can we do this jump, which is a significant jump in the way that I've drawn it. And then this inductive step, P of K implies P of K plus one is essentially saying, if I'm on this rung of the ladder, the Kth rung, then I can climb up to the K plus first rung. Can I climb? And so once you can get on the ladder, namely the basis step, and if you're at any rung, you can climb up to the next rung, then essentially these two pieces are enough to say that you can climb arbitrarily high up on the ladder. That's my kind of picture for today. This is my math picture <laughs> for induction. Is the idea kind of clear? Logically, what we're writing or what we're doing is we're saying P of one and P of K, uh, well, I need a for all K and for all mm, P of one and for all K, P of K implies P of K plus one Together, these should imply for all n, p of n, where here n is in z greater than uh, greater than zero. <laughs> right, uh, helicopter escape is the the right way to think about it. I agree. But but the helicopter keeps going up, but keeps deploying more ladder. So I have to use my own strength to keep climbing. Um, maybe there's a fire on the ground. <laughs> I need to go up the fire escape. I'm recording this lecture. Wow. OK. Um, I'm just a little tired. Uh, OK, what do we want to do next? OK, so I should um, explain kind of a little bit why these two propositions imply this proposition. So why, why is this valid mathematically? And the idea is we use the well-ordering principle. The well-ordering principle. which says if M is a subset of the positive integers, then M has a least element. Nice. Welcome to welcome to induction, Kat. Um, so this is a kind of believable thing, right? You take a you take some subset of the positive integers, and it should have some least element. It turns out we're going to take this as an axiom, and we're going to use it. So assume to the contrary. Well, so, I, so I'm trying to essentially prove this statement 
And if I start off a proof by assuming to the contrary, what assumptions am I going to make? That m does not have a least integer. Oh, I'm going to use this to prove this statement. So for contradiction, I'm going to assume this, and I'm going to assume this, and I'm going to assume not this. Yeah, probably that wasn't very clear when I asked you what I'm proving. But that's what I'm going, I'm going to be using uh, contradiction on this. So assume to the contrary that p of 1 holds, and for all k, p of k implies p of k plus 1. And uh, p of n is not true for all n greater than 0. Now what I'm going to do, yes, thank you, Oscar. Uh, so we're going to define, or we take the set m of all positive integers such that p to the m is false for m in m. So m is a subset of the positive integers. Also, m doesn't contain 1, right? Because I know that p of 1 is true. 1 is not inside m. Are we with me so far? I'm, I'm assuming that this does not imply this. Thus, I can produce a set m of positive integers such that p of n is false, even though I have all these things. m is a subset of the positive integers. 1 is not in m because I know p of 1 is true. By the well-ordering principle, M has a least element uh, call it M1, and M1 is greater than 1 because it's not equal to 1, and it's a positive integer. OK. But since M1 is the least element, I know then that P of M minus 1 must be true. Because M minus 1 is in Z greater than 0, and M minus 1 is not in M because it's smaller than the least element. Sorry, this should be m1 minus 1. I'm, I'm working with the least element of m and the integer that's one smaller than the least element of m. But p of m1 minus 1 being true implies p of m1 is true by my assumption that for all k, p of k being true implies p of k plus 1 being true. And this is a contradiction. Honestly, all this argument is is a formalization of the ladder argument. It's just a ladder. OK, uh, so all of this is just to show why this is a valid mathematical proof structure. Is that OK? Excellent. So proofs by induction are usually very rigid. So I'm now going to write out a series of steps that you can use in any induction proof, and indeed every induction proof. So steps to prove induction, or to use proof by induction.
The first step is we express the statement, the statement as uh, for all n greater than or equal to b, uh, we have p of n. We want to write it out carefully like this, whatever statement we're trying to prove. In the above example, well, I'll write these down without an example, but then we'll immediately do an example. Two is we write basis step. And then we prove P of B is true. Usually proving P of B is true is either a vacuous or trivial proof. Usually the basis step is just like, you just write down one line and you say, ah, one is equal to one, thus P of B is true or something like that. Okay, next step is, can we say base case? Yeah, base case works too. A viable alternative base case. Um, next we do inductive or so write uh, inductive step. So then what you do is you assume and you, you can actually literally write this, assume P of K is true for an arbitrary uh, K greater than or equal to B. Okay. The next step in the book, I disagree with. So disagree. This, this step can lead you astray. The book says, um, the book says, write down P of K plus one explicitly. I would rather you not do this as part of the proof because you can accidentally assume what you're trying to prove. We're only assuming P of K we're not assuming P of K plus one. So we're only assuming P of K. It's helpful to write down what the statement P of K plus one is somewhere else, but I would not write it right on the page like this suggests. So I'd cross this out and I'd say, do this on scratch paper, do this elsewhere. You do need to know what the explicit statement of P K plus one is, but you shouldn't write it right below P of K. Okay. Uh, five is you prove P of K plus one, probably using P of K. P of K, and then this is called the inductive hypothesis. And then six, you say this completes the inductive step. And then seven, thus for all n greater than or equal to b, p of n by induction. So, it's a very rigid step-by-step -step procedure that you are asked to perform when you're doing a proof by induction. And what I will do in the remaining 15 minutes is to try to do at least two examples, which go very step-by-step. -step. Uh, you may have questions, but I kind of ask that you hold on to your questions until you see an example worked out. But I'm a softie, so does anyone have questions? Okay, cool. Uh, actually, I can start here. So first example, let's prove 
that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to n is equal to n times n plus 1 all over 2. And really what this statement means is I'm proving that something holds for all positive integers n. I'm not proving this for any given specific n, I'm proving it for all positive integers n. Okay, so step one, step one, okay. Um, let's express this statement uh, in, as we are asked to do it. So for all uh, n greater than or equal to one, the left-hand side is the summation from i is equal to one all the way up to k. Uh, oh, I should do n. For all for the summation from i is equal to one all the way up to n of i, this is equal to n times n plus one over two. So I have a clear writing of what I want to prove. So now we do the base case. What is the um, smallest integer that I need to prove this for? What n is my smallest n? Yeah, base case, n is equal to one. What is the left-hand side? Then the summation from i is equal to one all the way up to one of i is equal to one. And one times one plus one over two is equal to one. Right? All that I'm doing here is I'm examining this expression when n is equal to one. I've got one is equal to one plus two over two, and they're equal. So that's the base case. So P of one is true. We okay how the base case went? Great. Okay, so next inductive step, and I should start a new page. I wish that I had a huge chalkboard so that I could keep all these rules like off to the side as I did the rest of the problem. Okay, uh, step three is I write inductive step. We assume that the summation from i is equal to one all the way up to k of i is equal to k times k plus one over two. So this is, in other words, we assume p of k, right? This is the statement p of k. Now what I want to examine is p of k plus one. So now what I would write is now examine I'm not going to write out the full statement of p of k plus one. I'm just going to write down one piece of p of k plus one. So I'm going to write uh, the summation from i is equal to one all the way up to k plus one of i, which is equal to one plus two plus three plus plus k plus k plus one. This is the left hand side of p of k plus one, right? Now I want to use my assumption on p of k when dealing with this expression for p of k plus one. What do I know that this is by assumption? This is the left-hand side of P of K, right? So here I write, by the inductive hypothesis, namely the fact that I assumed P of K, 
one plus two plus all the way up to plus k plus k plus one is actually equal to k times k plus one all over two, right? This, this whole chunk is assumed to be equal to k times k plus one over two. That's what the inductive hypothesis is. Or in other words, that's what P of k asserts. Plus k plus one. Now, what is this? Well, I should simplify. This is equal to k times k plus 1 over 2 plus 2 times k plus 1 over 2 to get a common denominator. And this is equal to k times k plus 1 uh, plus 2 times k plus 1, all divided by 2. Um, and what I can do here is I can factor out a k plus 1. So this is all equal to k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 2. Ah, it's like magic. What I have done is I've started off with the left-hand side of p of k plus 1. This is the left-hand side of p of k plus 1. I used my statement about p of k, or I used the inductive hypothesis to change this expression into something that I could deal with. And then I did an algebraic manipulation. And at the end of the day, what I have shown is that the summation from i is equal to 1 all the way up to k plus 1 of i is equal to k plus 1 times k plus 2 all over 2. But this thing, if you think about it, is really k plus 1 times k plus 1 plus 1 over 2. And this is exactly the statement p of k plus 1, right? Thus, this concludes the inductive step. I agree. It is lovely. Thus, the summation from i is equal to 1 all the way up to n of i is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2 by induction. Very nice. OK. Questions on this? So let me point out a couple things. These proofs tend to be a little long, but they're very formulaic. They all fit into a very standard pattern. The first thing that you do is you prove the base case. And proving the base case is almost always just trivial, either trivial or vacuous. Like all you do is plug in some numbers and say, ah, look, the statement is correct for this particular number. Oh, look, one is equal to one times one plus one over two. Okay. The the real kind of meat and bones of an inductive proof is you assume the statement p of k. Then you start off by writing p of k plus 1, but you don't write the whole statement. You write one part of it. You use your assumption. What was the second step? The second step was just the base case. The first step was writing out carefully what we're trying to prove. So the third step is we write down p of k, and we assume that. The fourth step is that we show p of k plus 1 using p of k. So what I'm trying to show is that this thing is equal to this thing. So I wrote down the left-hand side, and I used a substitution from my assumption p of k. 
And then I worked algebraically and it turned out that I got the thing that I wanted. So this inductive hypothesis part is usually the, the challenging or difficult or non-trivial part of the inductive proof. So very formulaic. Um, it seems as though I have used up pretty much all of my time. I don't have time to do another induction. I would urge y'all to read um, examples. I'll probably do several examples from the uh, exposition section of the text so that you can both see me doing it and explaining it. And you can also read the examples. And I think that that together should give you a good understanding of what we're doing with induction. Any questions? If there are no questions, I really hope that y'all have a wonderful weekend. Take some time to relax this weekend. It's good for you. Uh, yeah, we do have one more test before the final, unfortunately. It would be more spaced out if our semester were more spaced out, but it will kind of feel jammed up against the final. Yep, thank you all. Hey, Kalyani, do you have a question? Um, I was just wondering when the next exam is going to be. Probably like around November 9th or November 10th. So we've got some time before it comes along. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure.